Thank you for being here. I call the uh, Joint Committee for Ways and Means to order for our final uh, community hearing of uh, 2015. Uh, it is wonderful to be here in Grants Pass. Thank you so much for, for hosting us here. Uh, the committee has been all over the state. We started in the Grand, uh, we went to Boardman, uh, we went to Lincoln City, uh, Gresham, uh, starting to lose track of Springfield. Uh, we are some bills. Of course, we'll see Washington. PCC Washington County, is that where it was? Yeah, Hillsboro. Uh, we were in uh, OIT last night, and uh, we are uh, ending up the, uh, the hearings uh, here today. Um, I'm going to take a quick moment to, to allow the committee members to introduce themselves, and then we will uh, talk about the logistics of the hearing, how, how it's going to work, and then we'll have our, our first panel uh, 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 start off the hearing. Dr. Sable, you can come up and join these other two gentlemen here if you want to, to start us off. First, I'm going to start, would you be so kind to introduce yourself and say uh, who you are and what district you represent? Yeah, is that close enough? So, Hello everyone, it's good to see so many people I actually know here. So my name is Dwayne Stark at House District 4. I'm homegrown here in Grants Pass, but I went to Hidden Valley for all you actually Grants Pass High School people. And uh, my district is basically the outskirts of Josephine County all the way to just before Medford City limits. So Rogue River, Eagle Point, Central Point, White City, uh, all that entire area. So it's good to be home to what I call the land of the sane. <laughs> And I'm uh, Senator Arnie Roblin from House, Senate District 5. Uh, my district goes from my home, hometown now, Coos Bay, but it, uh, South Coos Bay all the way to Tillamook Bay, and then into the valley at Sheridan and Fall City, so parts of seven counties. My name is Chip Shields. I represent North and Northeast Portland in the Oregon State Senate, and this is just an amazing turnout. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Herman Bearchiger, Senator uh, District 2, which is most of Josephine County, the northern half of uh, Jackson County, including Rogue River, White City, and Central Point. <coughs> and Grants Pass is my hometown. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Gail puts it House District 56, which is Klamath and Lake County, and I'm in my second term. <coughs> I represent Peter Buckley. I represent uh, South Jackson County, everything from the Green Springs down through Ashland, Talent, Phoenix. Uh, take a little bit of Medford into my district, head over, take Jacksonville, and into the uh, Applegate Valley to Rouge. I'm Senator Richard Devlin. I represent the people of Lake Oswego, Westland, Tualatin, and Lower Southwest Portland, basically where all three metropolitan counties come together. I'm Betsy Johnson, I live in Scarpoose. I represent North Tillamook County, Clatsop County, Columbia County, Multnomah County in the industrial working waterfront and over the hill to Bethany and rural Washington County. I'm Doug Whitsett, representing District 28, uh, Plymouth, Lake, Crook, Chutes, and the uh, north, northern part of Jackson County. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Doc Bates, I'm from Ashland, Medford, and up to Green Springs and out to the Applegate, uh, up to Rouge. Up a little Applegate and uh, out in Jacksonville. Glad to be here and I've seen some friends in the audience ready. Hello and welcome. My name is Bill Hansel. I live in the town of Athena, which is north of Pendleton. I represent uh, Senate District 29, which starts at the Idaho border of Hills Canyon, goes Wallowa, uh, uh, Union, Umatilla, Morrill, Gillum, Sherman, and rural Wasco County. And, uh, my <laughs> this is a sure SM58. I love this. It brings me back in my uh, old hometown. I tried to get back here for a couple of weeks and haven't had too much luck. Good to be back at my alma mater today, Carl Wilson, District 3, Grants Pass, Cape Junction, and Williams. Good to see all of you today. Thank you. Uh, the way these hearings work in our effort to, uh, to hear as many people and your viewpoints on the, the budget needs of the state as possible, we limit testimony to two minutes each. Uh, we can usually get through somewhere around 50 or so uh, folks during the course of a hearing. Uh, we ask that you, uh, you actually adhere to the two minutes. If you want to go under two minutes, that's fine as well. We have this little uh, uh, 
stop clock here a minute. It will turn green when you start talking. So the first uh, minute and 30 seconds will be green. After a minute 30, it'll turn yellow, and then it'll turn red when the two minutes is over. And when it turns red, we appreciate if you just wrap it up so the next person will get a chance to talk. It's going to be a little bit strange that uh, there's also an overflow room, and uh, Superintendent Higgins will talk a little bit about that to explain how it's going to work. Because uh, we have folks who are signed up to testify who are in this room and also in the overflow room, so we'll try to get the logistics on that to work as, uh, as smoothly as possible. So the way that we'll start off is we'll start off with our, our three first witnesses, and then we have on-deck chairs here in the front row. So uh, when your name is called to testify, please come down and take one of the on-deck chairs, and as this panel completes its remarks, the next panel will come forward, we'll call the next on-deck panel, and we'll move the folks through uh, in, that, in that manner. So with that, again, thank you for hosting us, and uh, I'd like to uh, offer uh, Superintendent Higgins the uh, opportunity to uh, address the committee. Thank you. Just from a logistical standpoint, for those folks who are standing, we do have an overflow room available. It's the boardroom at the bottom of the drive where you came in. We've got staff down there who can see. We have a live feed in there with audio. If you are on the sign-up sheet and you need to testify, if you can listen for your name being announced for the on-deck portion, <coughs> and you have about six minutes to, to get up and, and to take the seat, and we do have a golf cart for those who would like to be driven up so you can make sure you meet that time constraint. Thank you, Superintendent. Please, if you have remarks for the committee, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. Co-chairs Devlin and Buckley and members of the committee, my name is John Higgins. I'm the superintendent of the Grants Pass School District. On behalf of the board, staff, and community, I welcome you to our district and thank the committee for making itself available for public input on the budget. I have submitted for the record a letter from Southern Oregon superintendents summarizing the impact of the recently approved $7.255 billion K-12 budget. This letter echoes what I'm sure you've been hearing in these meetings across the state that given the additional cost of providing full day kindergarten, this funding level will continue what has become the new norm of education funding in our state. One in which large class sizes, staff and program reductions, reduced instructional time, unfunded mandates, delayed textbook replacement, and deferred capital maintenance projects have become the status quo. Although the specific impact varies between districts based on a number of factors, including enrollment trends, collective bargaining obligations, and each district's cost to offer full day kindergarten, as a general matter, at the current funding level, districts will be unable to restore or pursue what's needed to change the unacceptable educational outcomes for which Oregon has unfortunately become known. Listening to the school funding bill legislative debate over the past few months, there was one term heard over and over again from legislators of both parties, and that term was inadequate. This not only demonstrates a broad agreement that the current school funding level is insufficient to provide our students the education they deserve, it also establishes a clear legislative priority to find a way to increase our K-12 investment through budget savings in other areas, identification of new revenue sources, or a combination of both. In conclusion, while prioritization of the K-12 funding thus far in the budget process is greatly appreciated, and it is greatly appreciated, the inadequacy of the current K-12 funding level has been clearly demonstrated and needs to be increased in order to make a meaningful investment in our schools, our students, and our future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Regents. In Mildred, it looks like Dover, Kim DaCosta, and it could be Joey Woods or Joyce Woods uh, to come to the on-deck seats, please. Dr. Sager. Thank you very much, uh, legislators. Uh, it's wonderful to see you down here, and we're appreciative of your time. Um, in the past, we have had just tremendous support on capital projects. You will also know that uh, Churchill has been remodeled. We have the science building that will move into this fall. Uh, it's really, really exciting because all of the science people moved into uh, Cascade uh, dormitories in order to make this happen. It's never happened before in the past. We have the McNeil Recreation Center, that's being worked on, and we're also looking forward to new things on remodeling of the theater and possibly a new footprint for the JPR um, building. The uh, support for the $275 million will be very much appreciated from us. 4.8 of that will be for Red Hall, our third oldest building on campus. The universities need $755 million. And at this funding level, all seven campuses will benefit. We need this money for support for our underprivileged students, our increased financial aid, better academic counseling, and support for students and increased graduation rates for Oregonians. I met a student the other day going to Clearstream in White City who is an honor student, 
and she is uh, working 40 hours a week at Safeway and still maintaining a high grade point. We need support for these types of students. At White City, they were looking at many of our students who are graduating and working for them. I just got an email from Laura Hughes from Chemistry and Flora in research here in Grants Pass has asked for two more interns, two more lab technicians, and they are growing. So we need to support science and support of our students. We were in Salem, and thanks to you all, I see so many of you supporting our student athletes. And the NAI National Football Championship was really well received. We had the governor there and the representatives from our community. I would ask you to support our sports lottery fund and that investment of eight million or greater would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much for being here. We are appreciative of your concentration and support for our education for Oregonians. Thank you so much. Roy Saigo, president of Southern Oregon University. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Co-Chair Dillon, Co-Chair Buckley, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Scott Beveridge and I'm the Director of School Improvement at Southern Oregon Education Service District. I'm here today to represent the many school districts in Southern Oregon. You will hear or have heard uh, from Southern Oregon superintendents today about their concerns regarding the current $7.255 billion education budget and its impact on their schools and students. But these are not just concerns of the districts who are able to share with you today. I want to convey that there's a unity of voice and a combined energy regarding the impact outlined in the joint letter that Superintendent Higgins referred to. Uh, they have signed this letter and I will leave this for your review. Uh, some of the specific concerns include implementation of full day kindergarten will require taking resources from other programs. Class sizes will remain elevated or increase further textbook purchases to teach Common Core State standards and the upcoming Next Generation Science standards and all of our education standards will need to be delayed making forward progress in unfunded initiatives and mandates will be difficult. Increasing graduation rates and having students reading by third grade, these are monumental efforts, and uh, especially without adequate funding. So we want to make sure that above all, you remember we've experienced significant cuts over the last six years, and this budget does not restore those cuts or support progress in unfunded initiatives and mandates. We're disappointed that an improving economy has not yet yielded a budget that would lead to restoration and improved services for our children but one that will once again have us considering cost-cutting measures or keeping status quo. We encourage you to continue to look for ways to increase the amount allocated to K-12 in year two of the biennium. As Superintendent Higgins said, we are very appreciative of your efforts this far, uh, and we thank you for your time today and your service. Thank you. The next group to come forward, uh, the on deck chairs, uh, can I have uh, Jenny Woods, Michael Endicott, and Michael Warner, please? Start on in. My name is Mildred Marie Dover, and I am a victim of domestic abuse. We were together 20 years. He had a master's degree in psychology. He was a respected drug and alcohol counselor. He could have been one of your neighbors. When I left him, I had only the clothes on my back and no money. I ended up at the women's shelter, in which I was allowed to stay only two weeks, due to funding. It is based on how many people are served, and those without children count less than those with children. I was then dropped off at the local homeless shelter. There is no help for women like me without children other than there. We are counted less by our abusers, and we are counted less by those who fund these programs. Yes, there are grants for domestic violence, but you must have children with you at the time that you apply. Those who have children in their care can also receive tennis grants along with the grant for domestic violence. What little funding is available goes mostly to those with children in their care, such as to vest violence grants, tennis grants, and child support payments. I could not even apply for any of these. I have no children. However, some women who do have children leave them with their abusers because the children can remain safely in the home while they cannot. The abuser may have the only car and the only access to their accounts. There is no general assistance any longer and there is no other resources available to us. I had a choice as most victims do in my case. 
I had the choice of either going back to my abuser or making it on my own. I was lucky. I made it on my own after living on the streets for some time. But unless you make all domestic violence grants available to those regardless of status, with or without children, some will go back and some of those will die at the hands of their abusers. Thank you, Mr. Wright. I'm going to have to ask you to stop there. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kim DePasta and I'm the Executive Director at Armadillo Public Charter School on the Delta Technical Institute in Phoenix, Oregon. And I'm here to speak about the Senate Bill 819. Um, as you've heard, uh, school funding is, is very tight, but for us at a public charter school, it's even tighter. We don't receive the funds that the general regular public schools receive, and therefore, we operate on even less of a budget than, than the regular public school. And um, our students are the same students that, that come out of the, the general public school system. And they come to us mainly at our school uh, because the, the larger public school is not working for them. And they need a smaller class size and they need a different kind of an educational setting. And we try to provide that, but we have so much less funding. Um, in addition to the lack of funds that pass through to us, we, we don't, we're not able to apply for a variety of funding streams, like bonds and things like that that would greatly improve our facilities. Um, our facilities are extremely run down. Uh, when our students show up to school, they, they show up to buildings that are decaying and falling apart. Carpets that are worn and, and stained and, and we are trying to provide an environment where they feel not like second-class citizens, but that they are equally as important as they were when they were at the regular uh, public school. So we're hoping that Senate Bill 819 will pass and we will support that so that we can provide a better quality of education than we already provide with less funds, but we have more funds available for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Joey Woods, and I'm a student at Armadillo Technical Institute, and I would like more funding for my school because the rooms are decaying, the buildings are decaying, and there's no after-school clubs, and that would be a great help for the school. Thank you. I have a Melissa Ballard, Jessica Bell, and Judy Christensen. Uh, please take the deck seats. <coughs> Folks, uh, I, I don't mean to clamp down on the applause, but it does take time for the testimony. If you want to show approval, you can do the, the hand wave, and everybody here will see that you're approving the testimony. And that way, we're going to keep the, uh, keep the words closed. So please, start us off. My name is Jenny, and I'm um, standing up for Armadillo Tech also. I'm a single mom. I have six kids. Um, we're survivors of domestic violence. My kids are, have DTSD, depression, anxiety. When they were in the mainstream school, they were having vomiting, headaches, stomach pain, and noise levels, and they were missing a lot of school um, when they were in the public schools. So the smaller structure of Armadillo, they enjoy school now. And I have two kids at Armadillo, and one kid at the Phoenix High School. Um, I would just like for them to get funding so they can paint the school, they can get books and start theater and soccer, FFA, robotics, the things that the other schools have that they don't have at Armadillo. Um, music, extra clubs, it would be very nice for them. And an indoor play area, I know for PE they kind of jog around and go to the city park and stuff, but it would be nice if they had the actual indoor place that they could do PE and stuff, that would be awesome. Have a basketball hoop in there for winter, that'd be great. And then if they had a 15 passenger van, I think that would be totally awesome to help with their trips that they go on, just sanctuary one in Applegate, um, maybe do a senior trip for the seniors, that would be nice. So I believe that each student should get 100% of the funding for the public schools that they, they get, but I think that they need it at the Armadillo. And the teachers need to get raised too, like the regular schools have. 
And I also want to say PCL. I have a, a child over there too. And um, I do want to stand up for my other son, Thomas, and I think that they he raises also over there. Their funding is low, and I did not even know that till today. So I want to stand up for them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Buckley and Senator Devlin, Deb, Devlin and members of the committee for your service to Oregon. It's well appreciated. My name is Michael Endicott. I am an art teacher at North Middle School here in Grants Pass. I'm also the Region 3 Vice President of the Oregon Education Association, and I serve uh, what is basically the 2nd Congressional District. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, I represent a lot of educators, and today I want to talk about Pat Olson. Uh, she works in the Title I school in Howard Elementary in Medford. Today, in a grand expression of irony, she is not here because she is fundraising for a sixth grade field trip that did not fit in the budget. Cat is allotted one ink cartridge a year, which she has to replace uh, at $100 each if she wants more. She teaches sixth grade. They do research. They print things. She was out of Toner in December, yet the legislature allows payments to the tune of about $95 million to local governments to give tax breaks to industry. She'd like, just like a supply of paper, pencils, markers, erasers, glue, and a uh, smart board, like the schools in the higher socioeconomic areas of her city. Yes, a smart board, smart board would be nice. Yet the legislature allows about 400 corporations to the option to pay zero taxes. $7.225 billion just doesn't get us to a better Oregon. It's not responsible to our students or our, our ideals about providing the opportunity for a free and appropriate education for every child. This budget is a cuts budget. We have one of the shortest school years in the nation. We have the second or third highest, largest class sizes, and one of the lowest high, just high school graduation rates in the US, and the, the lowest tax rate, corporate tax rate in all 50 states. We need opportunity for our students. We need resources that link, link in our school year, resources that put our teachers in the classroom to reduce class sizes, and resources that come from public services of all type that support student success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Mike Warner. I'm a retired teacher from Ashland. Um, I'm one of the original co-directors of Armadillo Technical Institute. I served on the first state uh, advisory board uh, uh, sponsored by OSBA on charter schools. I've helped write uh, OARs on charter schools. I've been working with average populations for over 30 years. I don't lobby for anybody. I don't sit on any boards and I don't want to be here. The reality is there was only one issue to in terms of Senate Bill 819 to discuss and that's whether or not students in charter schools are being discriminated against. Doesn't matter how much, doesn't matter why, it only matters if it's happening. The monies that do not flow through to charter schools, for the most part, are funds set aside by the legislature to serve specific populations. Students who are behind, students who need an extended school year, etc. Those students populate charter schools, at least in Southern Oregon, at a much higher than average level, and they don't receive those funds. Now, ATI is in uh, Phoenix Talent School District, what hap which happens to be one of the best districts for passing high levels of funds, too. If you looked at the study, you saw that in uh, the area around Medford and Ashland, we go up as 90% of the funding. So you just heard from ATI, they have it good. It does not matter whether or not districts can afford it. It does not matter whether or not people think these kids are good kids or anything else. What matters is they are entitled to the same opportunities as every other student in the public school system in the state of Oregon. The fantasy that charter schools are um, excused from administrative things is ridiculous. When we started ATI, I spent 40 to 60 hours a month or a year do, doing reports for you. When I left, I spent 40 to 60 hours, well, I was a year, I spent 40 to 60 hours a month. That fantasy is gone. Thank you very much for your time, and I really feel for you growing up in the old. Gotcha. And this panel uh, comes up, I have uh, Lorraine McDonald, uh, Joe uh, Fr Fr Fransham, and uh, George, I'm going to get your last name wrong, it looks like uh, Sorensky. 
take the other deck chairs, please? Please, Judy, go ahead. My name is Judy Christensen, and currently I'm the president of the Grants Pass Association of Classified Employees and a member of the OEA board from Southern Oregon. I represent the bus drivers, the cooks, the secretaries, the custodians, the security people, and the educational assistants who work with the students every day in our school system. I've been at Riverside Elementary for 28 years. It's very hard for me to come before you because I'm not, a, this really is out of my comfort zone. But adequate funding for our schools is a necessity. I work in classrooms that have 34 kids. Now some of you are going to go, so? Not you, but some of the people in the audience because they have even more. We're a K through five school. We have two fifth grades of 34 and two fourth grades of 30, which means that they get overflow time. So they get educational assistants who come in and help them with their reading programs, with their math kids, any project that they need, but almost always one-on-one -on -one student care. It's something that's in the teacher's contract. Those hours, we run, I run seven reading groups a day. I supervise the cafeteria and I work in the office. Back to the money. <laughs> Having lower class sizes isn't going to hurt my people, but it's going to help them. Having smaller reading groups, I've had reading groups as, of as big as 15 by myself and 13. I'm supposed to work with kids who are struggling and I love it. But sometimes we have to have Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Melissa Ballard. I'm here representing Kids Unlimited Academy Charter School in Medford, where I work as a second grade teacher. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, currently, an elementary school student attending a charter school only has 80% of his or her, her school state funding follow them to the charter school. The 20% that is retained by the district does not provide them with any additional instructional services and forces charter schools to attempt to provide more with less. Senate Bill 819 would require that 95% of that per student funding follow charter school students to their school. This would allow charter schools to provide more valuable resources, afford more experienced teachers, and ultimately improve the educational quality of charter schools across the state. For our school, these would be some of the impacts. Next year, this would be 350,000 additional dollars in the school budget. This would enable us to have our own school counselor to help support students and families. We would be able to have an art teacher and to purchase art supplies to build a stronger program at our school. We would also be able to purchase 50 iPads on mobile carts and a technology teacher to integrate technology into all of our subject areas. It would also allow us to hire intervention specialists to ensure students work through difficult behaviors to be more successful in school. And finally, we would be able to afford more um, field trips to help students see real world examples of what they are learning in the classroom. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for the opportunity to give you a glimpse into what the additional funding for my son at Kids Unlimited Academy would be. My name is Jessica Bell, and I am the mother to Logan, a 10-year-old boy who is very intelligent and a well-spoken young man. But he has behavioral issues. He has been on an, I he's been on an IFSP and an IEP since preschool. He's been, he spent his first three years in the Medford School District public school setting in the focus group. And while this was sufficient educationally, it was not helping him as he learning how to become a functional adult. When we heard about Kids Unlimited, we didn't think twice based on our experience with Tom Cole and the fantastic vision he has for the children in our area. <coughs> he wants them to become successful and inspired adults. It's very apparent that the staff at Kids Unlimited are there because they share Tom's vision. But the services that Logan receives through the Medford School District's IEP program could be improved upon. 
with the exception of Merrill Roberts, the IEP coordinators, and special educators have not provided the level of support and service that helps him work through his challenges while he achieves his educational goals as a talented and gifted student. The money would give Kids Unlimited the opportunity to hire people with the same vision that the rest of the collective has and be able to provide him the necessary tools he needs to become a successful individual. The additional dollars would help my son develop all the skills he needs to become that inspired adult who in life will make a mark on this world. Thank you. Thank you. And our next panel comes up by uh, Shelly Shaw, uh, David, um, could be Rocco, Rocco, uh, classified as a um, and Dean uh, Redman. Hello, my name is Lorraine McDonald, Dr. Lorraine McDonald. I'm a physician at Southern Oregon University. Go SOU. I'm the president of the Madrone Trail Public Charter School Board and have three children who have attended the school for a combined total of 17 years altogether. I was a founding board member of the school and continuous supporter since 2005. I'm very proud of our school and the Waldorf-inspired education my children receive there. We do an excellent job with what we have, and we consistently meet or exceed the test scores of equivalent district schools. We, as a charter school, are incredibly lucky to own a facility with an affordable mortgage. This would not have been possible without the generous donation of a single benefactor. Our facility is a beautiful but aging campus in need of regular maintenance and repair. Two of our classes meet in an old portable classroom building as we had run out of space and did not have the funds to build additional classrooms. The inequity of funding for bricks and mortar charter schools is in need of repair as well. In a national study of charter school funding, Oregon charter schools were receiving an average of $5,835 per pupil in public funds, while traditional public schools would have received $9,843 for those same students. As a result, the state's charter schools were receiving $4,008 per pupil, or 40.7% less than what the traditional public schools would have received for those students. This figure includes all sources of funding, and analysis reveals significant continued inequities for both operational and capital funding. We have a good relationship with our district, but we have unsuccessfully petitioned the Medford School Board for a small increase of 2% of the ADM to help offset all the costs that we incur that a traditional public school does not. Unless this bill is passed, we will continually struggle to maintain our facility in a safe and clean condition. We'll be unable to do the upgrades needed to increase the energy efficiency of our site, and we'll have to continue to offer our teachers substandard salaries. Yeah. I implore you to treat yeah. all bricks and mortar schools yeah. equally. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Joe Frodshin, and I'm the director of the Madrone Trail Public Charter School, and I know that you are all familiar with the numbers. You all are very familiar with the difficulties of financing the state of Oregon. What I would like to do is just let you know a little bit about where some of those dollars go. To the Madrone Trail Public Charter School, which has been around since 2007, and was founded by concerned parents who wanted to have Waldorf education for their children. And we have developed a school that supports Waldorf education. Our children do extremely well in testing. We had our first eighth grade class go to the high schools, and we talked with high schools and checked to see how they're doing. They go to advanced placement classes. Because of the language training they receive, they skip a year or two of language. At Madrone Trail, we offer Spanish for grades one through eight. Everybody has Spanish twice a week. We do handwork. Now, handwork might not seem important to you. It's teaching the children, first graders, how to knit, how to crochet, how to sew, how to do woodwork. We have a fabulous woodworking teacher. They have these experiences that help them develop emotionally, small motor skills, prepare for reading. It's a fabulous program. We um, have a games teacher or a PE program where they have games class twice a week, outdoors. They play, they learn games that they would play in groups and, and uh, not necessarily with the thumbs on the computer. We have a music program. Everybody in our school is required in the fourth grade and above to learn a stringed instrument. On music days, which is twice a week, 
We have 140 violins carried around our campus. It's one of the most magnificent views you ever see. We have wonderful children. They should be treated the same as public school children. They deserve, they are worthy of, my teachers deserve, my teachers are worthy of the support of our, the same type of support that the public schools get. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is David Racco. I am an information technology consultant at Southern Oregon University in Ashland, where we are currently undergoing retrenchment. In the past year, I have removed computers and telephones from faculty offices that will remain empty and have watched as our administration has outsourced our on-campus services one by one. Many of our full-time employees who remain, and those like them across the state, are paid so little that they qualify for public assistance, and some of them have even had to secure additional jobs just to make ends meet. This is a systemic problem, and we should not attempt to belie it because it is shameful that someone can labor for the public good in the United States of America today only to be paid and treated like a serf. Our struggle as employees has been considerable in recent times, but our students' struggle is even greater, and they are arguably already past their limit. There are student workers in my own department who rely on food stamps to feed themselves because the minimum wage is too low, and, can we, and we cannot afford to give them enough hours to cover their living expenses and the cost of their education, both of which continue to rise. This is one of the defining social issues of our time, and something must be done about it if we wish to remain a society of opportunity. Please approve House Bill 2070, which would redistribute the funds collected under gain share in our state, funneling more of that money to education where it is desperately needed. I also hope that we can count on your support and calling for one economic package for all seven state universities. We serve our students just as faithfully at SOU as our counterparts at our sister institutions, and all we want in return is the same compensation. Thank you. As our uh, next keynote comes up, we have Mark Kellenbach, Deborah Lee, and Kelly Wine. Uh, come to our next chairs, please. Did you say Eileen Leno? You know, I did, but I, I mispronounced your name horribly. Hi, I'm Peter Angstead. I'm president of Rogue Community College, and I'm filling in for uh, Dean Wendell, although uh, I'm not as wise as he is. Um, what I'm passing around is a uh, information on uh, what Oregon Community Colleges are doing, and I'm here to say I support all levels of education, and I especially appreciate uh, what the uh, Ways and Means Committee is uh, offering in the way of $535 million uh, support fund for community colleges. And I would ask you to consider if that could go to 550 because this really is an investment. And what this packet will show you is the results of some studies that we've done with last year's graduates where we're tracking our graduates in selected career technical education programs. And we're going to expand this quite a bit. But we're showing that those graduates are earning an average of 21 dollars an hour after they receive a degree or certificate. And if you could just imagine of the 17,000 degrees and certificates community colleges have awarded, if you annualize that on a year basis, that would return $777 million in wages to the Oregon economy. So that's really what we're doing is uh, we're taking your money as an investment and we're returning it uh, many times over. So we hope you will consider uh, 550 million and we do thank you for the 535 million currently allocated. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'm going next. <laughs> um, good afternoon, co-chairs and member of the committee. My name is Shelby Shaw. I am from Roseburg in Douglas County. I am a certified family child care provider with a five-star rating on the Quality Rating and Improvement System and proud elected executive board member of AFSCME, Local 132 Oregon Child Care Providers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. AFSCME Local 132 would like you to support 
would like for you to sorry for your support for $62 million to fully fund House Bill 2015, the bill to expand access for employment-related daycare. Funding this bill would help low-income working families across access stable, quality child care by doing several very important things. It will, give, it will give opportunity to more families to access the program by allowing for self-employed parents to once again be eligible for the program. It will provide one-year eligibility, which means that if a parent loses their job or is there, there is a change in their income, their child can continue to stay in care. It will lower co-payments for parents and provide for exit eligibility for 250% of the federal <coughs> poverty level. This means that a parent won't have to choose between taking a raise and losing their child care subsidy. Fully funding the bill would also provide for increased reimbursement rates for child care providers like myself who are struggling to provide quality care at current reimbursement rates. This will allow for parents to have more access to quality child care settings that best meet the needs of their children and within the hours that they work. Please take this opportunity to support working families in Oregon. Thank you again for your time, and I do welcome questions in my time. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Eileen Reno. I work with um, aging and people with disabilities. I'm not here to represent them. I'm just here to represent what I've learned through my experience there. And um, I want to thank you all for coming and, and creating these public forums so you and to hear our voices. I was um, I'm struck as I was struck last uh, the, the last time I was in front of the Ways and Means Committee in Ashland a couple of years ago. I'm just struck by all the, the, the good causes and the good people in the community who stand up and speak such heartfelt uh, messages to you and, and the fact that you hear them. And I know that you know that there is just so much in this pie to dole out. And that must be so difficult for you to do when you hear all this. Um, I can appreciate that. So I guess my message would be, uh, because I, I, I <coughs> work with the seniors and uh, disabled population. And especially with the seniors, we all know, especially with the baby boomers, um, there's this chart where the need is going to just keep going up and up and up. It's almost bright. Um, so we, we need to find ways to accommodate that. People do better at home and in the community than they do in nursing facilities. And that's actually my job, is to get people out of nursing facilities back into their homes. Uh, the main thing I want to say now that I have yellow light, so I need to speed up, obviously, is um, we need to get a bigger pie. Because all these, you all know that, all these things are so worthy and with our social structure. Um, to keep it strong, we need to make the pie bigger. And my question is, why do we have um, such a small pie when, when the money is there? Can we make it a little fairer? Thank you very much. Uh, as the next group comes up, uh, can I have uh, Clara and Michael B and um, uh, Carol Conley come up uh, in, to the on deck there? Cheers. And folks, uh, just we are straining capacity in the room, so just to note, uh, after you testify, uh, we won't take it as a sign of disrespect in any way for any of the issues. If you wish to, to uh, give up a seat to somebody else, uh, folks who are standing for RCC, love you guys. Thanks for being here. If anybody wants to uh, be in the overflow room and have seats there, that'd be helpful as well. Uh, so we just want to make sure we're careful of the capacity of the room uh, here today. So uh, why don't you go ahead, Mark, and start us off. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Committee. My name is Mark Kellenbeck. Um, here in my alma mater, Grants Pass High School. I think I probably sat in this space in middle school, too. So, come homecoming week for me. Uh, I'm here representing the Healthcare All Oregon movement. It's a grassroots movement supporting publicly funded universal health care in Oregon. It's a movement of tens of thousands and growing presently, and a movement that has been before you uh, several times with various bills. I'm happy to say we have passed a couple bills. One of those was House Bill 3260, which we passed in 2013. That's the Oregon Healthcare Study Bill. That bill 
outlines health care, I would say 21st century health care for Oregon, sets ideals and standards and values in place. And it asks the legislature to take a big step, a uh, first step in making that vision a reality, and that was the study bill itself. That's the name of the bill. In 2013, the bill was not funded. We had an estimate of 200,000 from a number of sources to do that study. The study is not unique to Oregon. There have been similar studies done in nine states. Most recently in New York, if you're following uh, the single payer, one payer movement. We would like to see the bill done in Oregon. We'd like to see it done and funded this session. The price tag is 350000 It could be the first step to saving the state, the state of Oregon proper, a billion dollars per biennium and providing world-class health care to our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, co-chairs and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Wine. I am a member and elected executive board member of Ask Me Local 2619, representing the employees of the Southern Oregon Child and Family Council. I am a Head Start teacher at SOCFC, and I have my master's degree in early childhood special education and a teaching license. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Ask Me Local 2619 would like your support for $30 million in funding for HB 33 which includes $10 million for reducing the wait list for Head Start and the state. With the reduced wait list, we need to make sure that we are maintaining child safe child-staff ratios with the age group that we work with. It is difficult to provide a quality education while providing the very often needed one-on-one -on -one while trying to maintain a safe, secure, and caring environment, especially for so many children who do not receive us at home. Additionally, I would like to encourage the legislature to look for ways to help ensure Head Start employees are paid competitive wages. HB 3380 sets provisions for achieving this, but it also needs to be funded. It is important to keep experienced and qualified teachers as well as support staff in our centers. I see many educators leaving for greener pastures where the pay is better and the stress and workloads are less. I'm not saying that everyone needs to have a master's or a teaching license, but I do think that Head Start needs to be competitive in the field of education so that it can recruit and retain quality educators. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Co-Chair Buckley and Devlin. Uh, my name is Deborah Lee. I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Nonprofit Legal Services, and we are a member of the Association of Oregon Legal Services Program. And so we partner together to create a statewide uh, legal <coughs> services program. Um, I want to thank you for your service. Um, we stand in the gap between the needs of public safety and human services. Many of our clients are elderly, disabled, and are veterans. And so when there's a cut in the state budget for services, we're overwhelmed by the need to provide representation. <coughs> we are 80% successful, we're efficient, we use paraprofessionals to assist lawyers, and we also count on our pro bono attorneys to assist us. Our clients are still not in recovery. They're still suffering from the last uh, financial crisis. And so are the legal services program because the recession caused cuts in resources to provide services. Um, so I would urge the committee to increase the level of the filing fee from 11.9 to 15 million. Uh, we are happy that the Cypre bill passed, but that's a future investment in providing access to justice. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, this comes up. Do we have Clara and Michael McPhee here also? Okay. All right. Uh, well, then, can I have, uh, 
think there's some folks in the overflow room there. Uh, Michelle Wilkerson uh, and Paul Young, if you want to join, uh, come right to the front table here. And uh, to the on deck uh, chairs, they get to, it looks like Eric Dolan, my apologies here if I mispronounced that, Rita Sullivan and Sue Densmore, if you are in the overflow room right here, uh, please come to the on deck seats. And please be seated. Thank you. My name is Michelle Wilkinson, and I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I am part of the support staff group for the Aging and People with Disabilities Office. We are the first face for people with no other recourse. We provide dignity and hope to low-income seniors and people with disabilities, as well as access to services for people who need basic necessities of life, including food, housing, care, and assistance with daily tasks. Some of the services needed are not found in our office, but we give them the resources needed to get them where they need to go for the appropriate help. One day a gentleman came into our office and was very worried about his wife. He did not know what to do. He was worried about her as she had recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and was being very combative. He wanted to be able to care for her but did not have the knowledge, skills needed. I was able to not only put him in contact with a Medicaid worker who was able to get him in, get him in home help for his wife, as well as get him information on counseling services, which teaches individuals how to deal with such changes and gives them tools to help themselves as well as the loved one. Approximately six months later, he came back into the office to personally thank me for the well-needed direction. With our, without our services, those we serve, the most vulnerable individual, individuals, would not be able to navigate the system. We get numerous phone calls and walk-in customers daily. Most of those individuals have tried to find help other places, only to be turned away and told they could not be helped. Please fund the Human Services Budget HB 5026 so that we can continue to serve the most needy who depend on us each and every day. Thank you for your service and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Hello, I'm Paul Young. I'm superintendent of the Rogue River School District. And like you, I struggle with a budget that is inadequate to do everything that I know I, that I should do. Like you, I have to prioritize. I know that if I don't fix the leak in the shop roof, I'm going to lose an entire program and that's going to affect the careers of many students. I know that I should buy math books this year. I know that I need to hire staff to avoid overcrowding in my elementary school. And I know that I cannot do all of those things at the current proposed funding levels. I'm forced to make choices that we should not be making for our children. These choices affect the future of Oregon, not just the present. When a ship goes down at sea, we save the children first. Others get in a lifeboat only after our children are taken care of. The crew goes down last of all. It isn't that we want to see anyone go down. We know our priorities, and we make the sacrifices that must be made, no matter how difficult. As a state, we don't have enough room in the lifeboats. You hear the cries of the passengers. It's your job to prioritize and you know that you cannot take care of all of the needs of the state. I don't envy you. Some of us must go down with the ship. Save the children. Good afternoon, co-chairs and members of the committee. My name is Carol Conlon, and I am a personal support worker in the home care program and SEIU member. I am a family caregiver which means that my adult son with disabilities can be, have care in the least restrictive environment. And I might add, he's a graduate of Grants Pass High. These, this, increase, this increases his quality of life and saves the state money. Providing care in the community rather than institutions reduces unnecessary hospitalizations and increases the richness of our community as a whole. The work we do in home care is vital to the increasing demand of long-term care. Therefore, recruiting and retaining a qualified and adequate workforce is critical for the ongoing care of our most vulnerable. 
less people will be attracted to this growing field of long-term care without recognizing that care providers deserve a living wage. Please fund home care to the Fair Labor Standards Act. And I might mention that um, we, we know that with each dollar funded, we get a $2 um, addition from the federal match. So by the same token, every dollar we cut, we lose two additional dollars. So um, I think um, the uh, obvious is, is there. Thank you for all your hard work and thank you for your time. So next panel comes up with uh, Bethany Osborne, Gary Fletcher, and uh, it looks like Regina uh, Manio. I hope I got that one. So you in the on deck chairs. <coughs> Come on up, on deck folks. Go ahead and start us off. Good afternoon. Roger Devlin, Buckley, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Eric Dollin, and I'm the managing attorney for the Grants Pass Office of the Oregon Law Center, one of the statewide legal aid programs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of increased funding for legal aid. Legal aid provides justice and fairness for low-income clients who are struggling with legal issues related to housing, employment, debts, benefits, domestic violence, and other issues. I see this every day. We help people understand their rights and responsibilities under the rule of law. Statewide, there are about 850,000 people who are eligible with only 90 legal aid lawyers to serve them. In Josephine County, there are 23,000 people eligible with only two legal aid lawyers to serve them. This is well below the recommended ratio of two legal aid lawyers per 10,000 eligible clients for minimum access. We have seen an increase in demand for services over the last two years as the local economy was still struggling. Like many rural communities, Josephine County has a higher rate of poverty and unemployment than other parts of Oregon. It has never really been the same since the timber industry faltered. We see an increasing need for services on matters related to domestic violence, housing, unemployment, and benefits. I want to tell you a little bit about my background so you can understand more about individuals who work in legal aid. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force and attended law school after completing my military service. I wanted to work in a rural office because I think that there is a closer sense of community. You can see how your work makes a real difference for families and the community over time. My work started as a staff attorney in the legal aid office in Ontario, Oregon. I moved to the legal aid office in Coos Bay for a couple of years and then came here to become a managing attorney in 1999. A large part of my work involves helping people with housing and senior law issues. We can often solve a legal problem with a brief phone call or quick letter. We have a relatively large number of veterans of Josephine County, many of whom are living in the Illinois Valley. They tend to come to the office seeking help with benefits. We need to add, need to add. Okay, thank that. you very much for your time. Your but thank you very much. Appreciate thank you for your work. My name is Claire McPhee, and I have taken care of the elderly for 33 years, 20 years of which I have been a provider in my own home. Prior to that, I have helped my mother, who owns a foster home, and she worked there for 17 years. Now my own son manages a foster home in Medford. As foster care provider, we care for the elderly in a home-like setting environment. In many cases, we become family to the elderly we provide care for. We provide medical, personal care equal to that of other settings. Adult foster care homes <coughs> provide hospice care, end of life, respite care, rehabilitation, memory care for the elderly with Alzheimer's and dementia at a comparably low cost for the state. And I would like to emphasize that one. Now the cost of living has gone up. <coughs> Inflation has gone up. Everything has gone up. Our pay rate, on the other hand, has not kept up with inflation and the cost of living. In reality, that equals pay cut to us. It will increasingly become impossible to operate our homes and stay in the middle class working people if we continue with this virtual pay shortfall. As this happens, elderly care will decline and the best option for seniors will be lost. Please remember this when deliberating the budget plan for Oregon. 
the seniors who have worked and pay their taxes to have a good life in their, in their end of life, living in a foster home, and us, the foster care providers who are middle class families who pay our income taxes, business taxes, property taxes, and who works hard for a living. And I also want to tell you that we have cared for people like. Thank you, like, thank, thank yeah. you so much. Can I pass this on? Yes, please do. Please get the testimony to the committee. Much of what I would say is the same thing, so I would cede my time uh, to the next if person. You, if you want to cede your time back, uh, that'd be fine. Uh, it would be redundant. So. Very good. Very good. <laughs> you, you, you do. Anything else you want to say, pass to the committee? Yes. We there. also save the state a lot of money, and this is what I have researched, and I would like you to um, verify the accuracy of this. For every elderly that we care for, we save the state at least 3,000 a month per adult. And that equals 36,000 per one adult. And for 100 elderly, we save the state 3.6 million a year for 100 elderly in our home. So if we're looking for um, you know, doing a budget, you should consider adult foster care home as a very good option. And we also provide a very home care setting for our elderly. And I appreciate your time and your presence here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. As, our, as our next panel comes up, we've got Tracy Jensen, Vicki Perslo, and Scott uh, Blauser. Uh, join us in the on deck circle there. You want to start us off? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Bethany Osborne, and I am a science teacher here in Grants Pass. And with me today is Brenton Hopkins. He's a fifth grader at Riverside Elementary. Um, he came here right after winning his baseball game today. Congratulations, Brenton. <laughs> and we are here to ask for your support for House Bill 2648, which would send all fifth and sixth grade students in Oregon to outdoor school for a full week. Um, Brenton is here. He's holding more than 400 letters from ranchers, teachers, businesses, students, parents, and community members from all around the state who are also supporting outdoor school. For students, outdoor school instills confidence, builds social skills, teaches collaboration, and offers high school students experience teaching. <coughs> it increases participation in school and increases attendance and test scores, which leads to higher graduation rates. Many students who are less successful in a traditional classroom setting thrive at outdoor school. They decide that they love science because of the active, hands-on learning structure. Outdoor school is the reason that I personally spend my free time exploring the outdoors. It's the reason I care about the land and water in our state, and it's the sole reason that I became a science teacher. Outdoor school changes lives. I would like to tell you a story of a student whose life also changed outdoor school. His name is Kyle. Um, I worked with Kyle when I was an animals field instructor at Arowana Outdoor School. Kyle arrived at outdoor school on Sunday afternoon with his class, and he got off the bus and was greeted by Toad, his volunteer buddy for the week. Kyle was selectively mute, which meant that at outdoor school, he was going to get a little extra support from Toad so that he could have a great week, just like all the other students there. Early on in his week, Kyle um, went to field study. He hung out with his cabin. He ate in the dining hall. He went to campfire, and he didn't say a single word. But by Wednesday, Kyle and Toad were having quiet, whispered conversations to each other, and his teacher was thrilled. Toad would answer for him on field study and share his responsibilities in the dining hall. And when Thursday came around, he came out to Animals Field Study where I was working. I hung out with the group late in the day. Um, they were at the arthropod station. They were crutching critters. Toad and Kyle were on the edge of a sampling plot, and I joined them on their hunt. We scratched around in the dirt for five or ten I'm minutes. I'm sorry, I have to stop you. Oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> he, he, to the he spoke to me. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Co-chair Stedlin and Buckley and members of the committee, thank you for letting me speak here today. My name is Regina Menino and I'm a senior at Southern Oregon University uh, who is graduating this June with above a 3.5 GPA and with over $45,000 of student loan debt. As a person who grew up in poverty in early childhood with two parents on social security disability in foster care as a preteen and then under legal guardianship in, ad in my adolescence, I feel very honored to have had the opportunity to attend a university and to have been able to succeed academically. 
Unfortunately, during this time, I've also been fighting many battles with everything from food insecurity to housing insecurity to health issues. In the handful of years since I've been attending college, I've seen a very troubling trend of disadvantaged students being priced out of higher education. Increasingly, I hear people insist that they can never afford to go back to school. The retrenchment at SOU, which I see is at least partially caused by the continued trend of disinvestment in higher education, is currently resulting in the elimination of programs that help people who have a harder time adjusting to college. For example, the SOU Schneider Children's Center, where I work, is on the chopping block this year, causing all kinds of logistical problems for students with young children, students who are considered non-traditional. I have read that the Multicultural Resource Center has also scored low in priority, which I consider highly disturbing considering the barriers that many people of color have to go through to attend college. I urge you to consider making rural colleges and non-traditional students, as well as minority students, a higher priority to the state. I strive to be a person who serves the community as I also become financially self-sufficient. Um, Please restore funding to Oregon's public universities by funding them at a minimum of 70, 755 million. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you've heard all kinds of testimony here now. Uh, not my turn. Well, okay. co chairs, members of the committee, and everybody else in the room, my name is Gary Fletcher, and I'm a PSW, which is a personal support worker, and I support. Uh, two individuals who are actually up there. Well, they're, they're waving at you, okay? <laughs> and I also a member of the SEIU. Uh, I'm actually from Douglas County, so crazy stuff. So I take care of those two individuals on a 24/7 basis. Uh, uh, what did you want to say? <laughs> concept. And why they are supposed to be why they're important to me because they're family, okay? Part of it. And I take care of them because most of the time, I don't, they're not going to foster homes, they're not going to house foster parents for a long time. Uh, in this category, they offer their freedom, basically what they go for each individual that's there. To do that, of course, the individuals that are uh, trained, willing to work in this category, in this home care uh, field, which is a growing field in the Oregon, which actually we offer, uh, all the colleges do, I should say, uh, our degrees in home care. Uh, which is an economic boost to the individuals since it's a growing, uh, it's a growing field and it's one way for, for Oregon to increase their economic base. Some individuals who are here who are looking for jobs to get them off of TANF, to get them off of other support, not being paid, you know, a lot of, a lot of the money part of this so far. But I'm here to also say that, that, that we need to be, you know, we serve the right to be compensated under the Stable Landers Act. And I think the SEAU and the rest of us working together can find ways in which to make Oregon a viable place. Thank the jobs available. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is there a next panel coming to you? And you can deliver the letters there. Representative Stark will read uh, all of them, I think. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Megan Mercier, uh, Heather Buchanan, and Emily Pfeiffer, please. Uh, take the on next seats and uh, jump on in and give us your testimony. Thank you. My name is Vicki Perslow and I am president of the Associated Professors of Southern Oregon University. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. The proposed co-chair's budget allocation will leave Southern Oregon University continuing to struggle under the financially precarious condition that we have endured for more than a decade, including two retrenchments the decimation of our dedicated full-time faculty and the shrinking of student services, student access to faculty and staff, a poor demonstrated predictor of student achievement, has substantially and dramatically decreased. Our students deserve better. Since 2011, SOU has lost 20% of its dedicated full-time faculty, which has come at a great cost, especially to our students. I have three key points for you to understand. First, educating our students through precious face-to-face -face interaction is lost due to workload changes and increased non-instructional responsibilities for the faculty. Our students are losing the attention from faculty they deserve and need, precisely the attention that SOU has, provided, has prided itself on providing. Our students deserve better. Second, our faculty are less available to students as they are saddled with administrative and clerical functions, a casualty of two rounds of deep retrenchment. Our students deserve better. Third, finally, 
faculty, adjunct faculty are being used not as a short-term remedy but as a long-term solution. Adjunct faculty are paid at exploitive rates and have replaced our dedicated full-time faculty and yet are not contracted to assist with the running and governance of the university or the advising of students. Our students deserve better. Our university must have stable funding to avoid further rounds of retrenchment and future degradation of student opportunity. SOU is not sustainable as long as Oregon ranks 47th in public spending per student. As president of APSU, I am here on behalf of our faculty and our greatest concern is for that of our students' success. Please reinvest in the future of Oregon's children and give SOU students and faculty the support they deserve by supporting the request for $755 million. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, my name is Tracy Jensen. I've been on the Wood River School Board for 14 years. Thank you. I don't have any new numbers for you. You guys already heard all the important facts from people much more eloquent and better dressed than me. <laughs> but I'm trying to make sense of the fact that when I first got, came on the Rogue River School Board in 2001, K-12 education funding was 49% of the state's budget. Now it's barely over 39%. What's happened to make public education less important? And what does that say about us as a state? I'm trying to remember by any of when we weren't begging for funding. I recall the days of on-site on -child, on child development specialists, licensed librarians, activity bus routes, complete music programs, and paid head coaches for every sport. I recall cutting all of those luxuries and 10 days from our school year. So with the current funding, Rogue River will not be adding anything back, and we will still be one of the lowest paying districts in Southern Oregon. Our great community attracts the very best teachers and staff, but we struggle keeping them. In order to do that, we need stable and adequate funding, and that's a phrase I've been saying for 14 years because it hasn't happened yet. One way of putting this, if you keep doing what you've always done, you will get what you've always gotten, or if nothing changes, nothing changes. So I know you work hard, but I'm here. Your takeaway from me would be that the Oregon legislature has to do something different. You have to do something profound because it takes what it takes to serve our people, not just education, but all human services. I will not support robbing Peter to pay Paul as a viable solution. <laughs> And maybe, just maybe, in the meantime, Santa Claus will come early for Rogue River, and that Christmas tree bill will have a big ornament on it that says K-12 funding. Good yeah. <laughs> afternoon, committee. My name is Scott Bloor. I'm a fifth-generation Oregonian, third-generation Rogue Valley resident. Thank you for coming to Southern Oregon that I know is God's country. Last night, as I understand, you were at Oregon Tech. I am an Oregon Tech alum out of the Civil Engineering Program. I'm here to talk today about higher education funding as well as Oregon Tech. I believe in Oregon Tech enough that for the last 12 plus years I've been part of the Alumni Association and have been here many times fighting for Oregon Tech and higher ed funding in general. <laughs> I believe in this because it gave me the opportunity that I have today. I'm a third generation college grad, and that is what has kept our family going forth. When I was in college, my dad was a displaced timber worker. It was higher education funding that got me through higher ed and allowed my two siblings to be there as well. Higher ed improves the wages of our citizens, which thus helps the staff move forward, advance forward. Oregon Tech has opened up doors for me that no other institution I feel could ever do. I'm an all, all mater of this high school here, third generation from this school. Unfortunately, I live in the county. My son won't be able to graduate from here at this point. But I still believe in this high school. Oregon is a backbone of this country. As a sideline business, I have a small farm. That's why I could not go to Climate Falls last night. I was bringing a hay baler from Eastern Oregon home, something that few of you may know I'm about. <laughs> I fight very hard to help parents and prospective students look at higher ed. It's becoming harder and harder to convince them to take on that debt, that burden, to get to that point. 
because of the lack of investment into that program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next one comes up uh, tonight out of David Holmes, uh, Commissioner Cheryl Walker, and my friend Ed, whose uh, name I'm going to uh, mispronounce, Ed Alexander. I always mispronounce your name, Ed. Uh, if you come to the on deck chairs, too. Hello, all. My name is Megan Mercier. I'm the engineer at SMU, who someday hopes to hold a position as a public servant like yourselves. I'm here today because I know that funding for our universities at $755 million is essential for preserving the longevity and quality of Oregon's institutions of higher education. I come from a low-income family in a small town in Colorado, and so SOU appealed to me not only because of its reasonable cost, but because of its small class sizes and inclusive campus culture. All of this is threatened at the, cur at the current funding levels. I came here on a movie scholarship in 2011, and the general federal loans were able to cover, just cover my tuition, and so my mom was willing to take out an $18,000 Parent PLUS loan, which helped pay for my on-campus housing, meal plan, and textbooks. Um, that following year, she was denied for a Parent PLUS loan, and so I was forced to drop all of my classes and take a year off until I was able to achieve status of an Oregon citizen, which I'm very proud of. When I returned to school, I was working three jobs, and I'm still currently working um, two of them. Um, I work more than 40 hours per week, in addition to keeping up with a full-time class schedule. I've been able to maintain a good grade point average, but my health, not so much. I'm constantly tired and nearly always sick, and I'm not the only student who's burdened by this reality. Despite um, working myself sick, I can't be uh, beginning to touching my student loan debt. I expect to graduate with nearly $50,000 in debt. Even though I feel like an academic, I have recently chosen to not apply to a graduate school because I can't imagine doubling or tripling my debt. The budget you're proposing is not enough. Not enough to support struggling universities, and not enough to stop the downpour of student debt held over the heads of hardworking people like myself. I implore you all to fully fund Oregon's future by restoring cuts to higher education and provide us with $755 million for universities and $550 million for community colleges. Anything less is not enough. Debt-free higher education is possible. Thank you. Hello, my name is Heather Buchanan, and I'm a second year student at Southern Oregon University and a member of the Honors College. I come from a dual income household and growing up I always knew that I would be able to go to college and get the education I needed to pursue my professional and personal goals. I chose to come to SAU because it offers small class sizes with professors that are able to further my career aspirations and has a small campus that fosters personal and professional relationships. While in college I've had the opportunity to become greatly involved in student government, take heavy course loads, and attend and present at many leadership development conferences without fear of not being able to take time off work or not working enough hours to pay for my schooling and personal expenses. These opportunities allow me to get the most out of my college career and make me a more competitive applicant for graduate schools and future employers, which will greatly increase my ability to follow my dreams and gain meaningful employment after graduation. However, I'm only able to do this because I receive a scholarship and financial assistance from my parents. My story is not typical of Oregon College students. For far too many people, rising tuition costs mean they are forced to work multiple jobs while attending school and incur thousands of dollars of student debt to earn a degree. This makes them unable to pursue the opportunities I pursued and prevents them from being as competitive an applicant as they could be, which hinders their ability to find meaningful employment after graduation and pursue their passions. Education cannot be the great equalizer that many of you believe it to be if so many of the career furthering opportunities are available only to the students who uh, um, are available to the students and only accessible to those who have the financial security to pursue them. For this reason, I urge you to make Oregon universities the equalizing forces they have the potential to be by stopping the downpour of debt, restoring the cuts, and putting the university budget at $755 million and the community college budget at $560 million. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Emily Kuyper, and I'm a sophomore at Southern Oregon University. Today I'm here to inform you of the negative impacts state divestment in higher education has had on my life and uh, many other students in Oregon. When I started school in the fall of 2013, I knew I wanted a career in psychology, which meant pursuing higher education was something I had to do if I wanted a job in the field of counseling. One of the many reasons I decided to attend SOU was uh, that I knew I would be paying significantly less for my degree than if I attended a university such as the University of Oregon. Currently, I have about $9,000 in student loan debt. 
I've been forced to take out loans, even though I am a recipient of the Oregon Opportunity Grant and the Pell Grant. I have also had to take it upon myself to work almost 20 hours a week just to make sure I can pay rent and buy basics for myself, such as food and electricity. I have to be careful every time I buy necessities, such as groceries, because I fear I will run out of money to pay my rent. All of, all of this is the result of me having to put such an extreme amount of my own income towards my education. As for other students at Southern Oregon University, they're facing very similar preventable circumstances as well. Uh, currently, Southern Oregon University is in retrenchment, which runs the risk of having to cut programs such as fine arts. As a university that prides themselves on being the liberal arts university of the West, it seems ridiculous that we cannot provide students with a degree in fine arts if they wish to pursue it. The more cuts our school faces, the less we become a liberal arts university and more of a trade school. The path that the state is headed down in regard to student loans is an incredibly dangerous one. Students are being priced out of higher education and being forced to enter the workforce right out of high school out of fear of going into high amounts of debt and falling deeper into poverty. It is clear that the state budget for universities needs to be set at 75, $755 million in order to ensure students will have the opportunity to pursue higher education without debt creating such a negative impact on our lives and future goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As the next panel comes up, folks, let's do a little time check uh, for us. Uh, we scheduled to end at 2. I'm going to call a few more panels up uh, and have the committee members be angry with me for the next week when we're back in Salem. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm going to try to skip around a little bit to get to some subjects that have not been touched on. Uh, so if I could have Matt Epstein, um, see here, uh, Laura McKean, and uh, Don Burks uh, come to the on deck seats here, and uh, Matt Fisher, why don't you start us off? Good afternoon, uh, uh, co chairs of Devlin and Representative Ben Puckley, and members of the panel. Uh, I'm very pleased to have you here this afternoon. I have heard some wonderful testimony today in regards to the needs for education and social services. I'm here to talk about the economic development that will bring uh, income to our community, to our area, and to the state. I'm talking about the regional solutions for a project at the Grants Pass Airport, our northeast side taxiway. This is lottery funds that is uh, put out to the um, various areas of the state to make uh, economic improvements. This is a project for engineering design and environmental uh, assessment study for a par parallel taxiway on the northeast side of runway 31 at Grants Pass Airport. The project is $425,000 out of, I believe, the $14 million that's available of lottery funds for regional solutions. This impacted area not only is the Grants Pass area, but it's our North Valley Industrial Park. It's all of Southern Oregon. Our airport is also used for firefighting. It's become the helicopter base for firefighting in the entire region. This airport is growing in operations, especially business use aircraft by local and regional companies like Dutch Brothers, Crosscraft, Pacific Aviation Northwest, Mercy Flights, Rogue Valley Door, Pacific Aircraft Management, and many, many others. A parallel taxiway is critical for safety, and runway access for any new, new development on the northeast side of our airport runway, as there is currently no more developable land, land to be developed with a frontage road access. The taxiway will first alleviate the critical safety issue on our runway incursions, and two, will open up development on the northeast side of our airport runway. This will allow construction of commercial hangars for great demand for the businesses looking to expand our operations. There is currently a frontage road, but no public access to the runway on the northeast side. This is an impediment to economic development at our airport. There are incursions approximately 20 times a day. This is an accident look, looking for a place to happen. We already have several large businesses, including uh, Crosscraft, Oregon Lifeguard, Great Pacific Trading, who have taken some of their aircraft elsewhere due to lack of runway access. I, uh, Thank you. Good. So, and you can state your name for the record, please. I'm sorry. Cheryl Walker, Josephine County Commissioner. Thank you very much. Yeah. My name is Ed Alcantar. I live here in Grants Pass. I've been here for 22 years. I am a Korean War veteran, and I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> and I see all the young people here, and everybody wants something. Well, I, I, we want something, too. <laughs> We're talking about the Oregon Independ Project Independence. It is the only program that I, as a senior, can identify and say, this is what we really need. We don't need extra money. We don't want any more money. It isn't that we don't want it, it's just that we're doing with what we have, and we're doing well. And I appreciate it, and I thank you very much for that. But, again, 
Project Independent is what gives us the motivation to get up in the morning and take care of our own personal business, not have someone who come and push us around or telling us what to do if we're not good, or being at home or an institution. And it's cheaper, much cheaper. Save a lot of money with that. And I'm hoping that people will understand that. that I'm coming from that different side of the, of the fulcrum. I'm done with that. The end of it. And like I said, I'm 87, and I see all this senior activity going on, and I said to myself, oh my gosh, these people really need help. So you know, keep it going. I appreciate it very much. I'll be hoping to you, Dr. Bates, Mr. Buckley, and there's another one. Oh, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> My name is David Holmes. I'm the superintendent of the Three Rivers School District here in Josephine County. I'd like to thank the legislators, legislators for coming to Grants Pass to hear input from your constituents in this part of the state, and particularly Representative Stark, now that I know he's a Hidden Valley graduate. Uh, the current 2015-17 state school funding level is woefully inadequate to meet the needs of the students of the Three Rivers School District. This budget represents the continuation of a recessionary budget that actually provides less dollars per student than last year. Over the past many years, the portion of the state budget that has been appropriated for K-12 has continually been decreased. During this time, while the funding level has decreased and the programs have been cut, the ongoing stream of unfunded mandates from both the legislature and the Oregon Department of Education is not. Three River School District is committed to providing full-day, all-day kindergarten this coming year, and although this budget provides us with the ability to hire teachers for that purpose, it does not fund any of the other associated costs. We have a huge backlog of a deferred maintenance all of our 18 campuses. Our CTE programs are a mere shadow of their former selves. The Southern Oregon Superintendent signed a letter that I know you today that presents to you and reflects the general challenges that this budget represents to all of us here in Southern Oregon. The 50-50 funding proposal that has been floated to districts as a solution for this upcoming school year, depending, which depends on future increases in the, in the economy, is dangerous at best. Lastly, I would ask you to fund House Bill 2721. This bill, which is a farm to school and school garden bill, uh, helps school districts access locally grown and raised foodstuffs for our students in our food service programs. This bill is good for our local economy and is good for the nutrition of our students. We have a wonderful budding relationship with the Rogue Valley Farm to School community here in our county. And we've had many budding successes already this school year, and this will dramatically help us improve that relationship and get good nutritional foods into our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as our next panel comes up, can I ask Robert Campbell, Diane Hoover, and Rebecca Pearson to be on deck seats? <laughs> Stein, and I'm here to speak out in support of adding funding to the Oregon State University statewide budget. By the way, thanks for your service as citizen legislators on a fine, sunny afternoon. I'm a rural landowner. I live in the Applegate Valley in Jackson County. My wife and I relocated to Oregon only 20 years ago. Soon thereafter, I discovered the OSU Extension Service and enrolled in the Master Woodland Manager Program. That program gave me knowledge and tools to help me begin the process of managing the 40 acres surrounding my woodland home. At the start of the program, I couldn't even spell the word silviculture. <laughs> a decade later, and a lot of practice, I think I've got that part down. <laughs> What's been ongoing for me, however, is the continuous learning that new woodland management approaches, tools, and techniques that are being researched and taught to the woodland owners like myself by the OSU Extension educators across our state. The real value of the Extension teachings came into sharp focus after several years of applying forest management thinning techniques. I live in a rural woodland uh, urban
Orbit Interface Zone, Square Peak Fire came through and laid down only several feet from my home. I hate to think what would have happened had I not learned about woodland management and thinning techniques to my log home. I'll close by asking you to support the efforts of the Extension Service by adding $16 million to the Oregon State University statewide public service budget. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dawn Burks. Uh, I was born and raised here in Grants Pass. I attended the county schools here. Sorry, Representative Stark, North Valley High School. Um, I'm also an RCC graduate. Um, and when I graduated from their human services program, I went to work in Jackson County. Uh, I'm here today representing Community Works. Community Works serves adolescents, young adults, women, and families who are working to overcome severe life crises and complex traumas. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak to you today. As the program manager of the Dunhouse Shelter, I work with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, providing resources, advocacy, and emergency shelter in Jackson County. Our immediate concern is the urgent need for increased resources for affordable housing to survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. In many instances, survivors have experienced years of complex trauma and neglect. Close to 50% of women and children who are homeless report that they have been subject to domestic violence in their lifetime. Many become homeless as a result of the abuse that they experience. They find it difficult to build a successful future because of numerous barriers, including safety concerns, decreased access to education, financial instability, limited transportation, and most importantly, difficulty to finding affordable housing. Jackson County has only 1% uh, rental vacancy, and as a result, lead wards tend to be selective as to whom they will rent to, and when a survivor has a poor or no credit history, a past eviction, and or a criminal record, safe and secure housing is nearly impossible for them to find. If they do find an option, they may be faced with a request for an unaffordable inflated deposit. Survivors not only need resources for affordable housing, but there needs to be incentives for rental property owners to permit someone who could be seen as what you might call high risk to be allowed to rent. It takes community involvement and commitment to help survivors rebuild their lives and to become sustainable. And we need your help in effecting this change in our communities and in our state. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Co-Chair Senator Devlin, Representative Buckley, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Laura McKean, and I am the Oral Health Integration Coordinator at All Care CCO. Our CCO serves Jackson, Josephine, Curry, and the southern tip of Douglas County. I am here today in support of our local public health department and also to advocate for continued and improved oral health benefits for our Oregon Health Plan population. It is very important to recognize that the mouth is part of the head, which is also a part of the body, and is a very important piece of overall health. I would also like to advocate for the consideration of the reinstatement of the denture benefit for our members. Currently, the Oregon Health Plan benefit only covers dentures if the denture is seated within the last six months of the tooth being extracted, the last tooth. When the Affordable Care Act went into effect, my phones at my office were flooded with members wanting to get appointments to get dentures. And to my heartbreak, I had to tell them no, that even though they had dental benefits now, there was no denture benefit for which they were currently eligible for. It is very difficult for someone to interview for, or more importantly, secure a job if they have no teeth. We all want to be able to provide for our families and to be able to hold your head high, smile, and talk to a potential employer is much easier if you have improved self-esteem and having teeth and smiling is a huge part of this process. I look forward to continued partnerships with our local public health department who does so much on such a limited budget. We look forward to currently serving the students in our schools that aren't being served right now, which is a very important piece for our public educators because if a child has an abscess tooth, it affects their ability to learn and be productive in class. As a CCO, we work diligently to help our members because we want the best possible outcomes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today.
Thank you very much. So um, our next panel will come up. I'm going to call one last panel before I do. Has anyone traveled more than 100 miles to get here and is waiting to testify? Seen none. Then I'd like to call Dennis Morgan, Sue Crater, and Alan Berlin to be the last panel uh, for today's hearing. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, co-chairs, Devlin, Buckley, and distinguished members of the committee. For the record, my name is Diane Hoover, and I am the public health director here in Josephine County, a Hidden Valley graduate and a military veteran. I'm here today to advocate for public health funding and to leave you with two points. The first point is that state funding for public health takes, makes a huge difference at the local level in economically challenged counties with low tax bases like ours. Josephine County ranked 32 out of 33 counties in Oregon for social and economic factors that determine health. The county rankings specifically point to unemployment rates in the double digits, that 34% of children in the county are being raised in poverty, and inadequate social support is a problem. Adequate state funding allows public health to do what it is supposed to do to protect the health and safety of its vulnerable citizens. We conduct communicable disease investigations, administer Title X family planning, provide immunizations to prevent disease. These are services required by state law, and I genuinely appreciate the state's investment in our community. The second point I'd like to leave you with is that All Care, one of the local coordinated care organizations, is also making a hugely positive difference in public health at the local level. In 2012-2013, I was facing serious staffing cuts due to declining general fund support. All Care, in recognition of the value of public health, provided a one-year grant of $171,000 to keep community services at status quo levels. We also recently partnered in a unique public-private collaborative that will increase access to clinical services from one day a week to four days a week, decreasing the cost to government and increasing the number of billable encounters. State public health funding and global CCO budgets must work together to make a positive difference. Thank you. Thank you. Folks who have not had a chance to testify, if you have written testimony, you can turn it in to the committee administrator and we'll be sure that the committee has access to your written testimony. Please. Co-Chairs Butler, Devin, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm Robert Campbell. I've been a nurse in this valley for 26 years. I'm here asking for your support for Senate Bill 469, the Safe Staffing Bill. As most of you know, most of you know a nurse, or at least know of a nurse in your family, or are married to a nurse, or have talked to a nurse. And almost every nurse that you've ever talked to will have a story about unsafe staffing, where they are, or where they've been. Nursing has moved, unfortunately, from a culture of safety and compassion to a culture of production. We're the ambassadors for the patient. Sometimes we're the last bastion of safety for that patient. Studies have shown, studies have shown time and time again, patients that come into the hospital, if the staffing is low or the staffing is in inadequate, they have an increased risk for infection, for readmissions to the hospital, and even for death. I wish that the hospitals would do the right thing and staff appropriately. We wouldn't need this law if they did that. But they don't, and we do. So please support Senate Bill 469. Nurses are what we are. It's not what we do. We care for compassion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, um, Co-Chair Senator Representative Buckley and the committee. I'm here today to speak to the importance of funding the Oregon Contraceptive Program, also known as C-Care. C-Care provides coverage for family planning services to individuals with incomes under 250% of the poverty level. Cuts to C-Care risk balancing the state budget on the backs of vulnerable patients who need life-saving health care services. C-Care covers services such as annual gynecological exams and preventative cancer screenings, FDA-approved birth control methods, and vasectomies. C-Care makes sense economically for the state and of Oregon and for Oregon women and families. Increased access to birth control is, a fundament is fundamental to improving women's health and the health of their families. The cost of birth control each year is equivalent to five weeks of groceries for a family of four, nine takes of gas in a minivan, or one semester of college books. There are still women in Oregon who do not have comprehensive health plans and need the programs for immediate coverage that serves to full coverage. As health 
health care transformation continues to take shape. C-Care remains a vital program for those who can least afford the services that they need to remain healthy and achieve the best health outcomes. Thank you for your consideration. Sorry about that. I'm Rebecca Pearson, and I am the um, chair of Planned Parenthood's leadership and advocacy team in Jackson County. Thank you. Please jump on. Yes. Uh, Co-Chairs Devlin and Buckley, uh, committee members, uh, thank you for the time and the opportunity to testify. Um, I, I'm just, uh, I thank you for the service that you that you provide. I know it's very, very difficult to make the decisions that you have to make, and we appreciate that very much. Um, I am, uh, my name is Dennis Morgan, and I am the uh, the chair of the Southern Oregon Research and Extension uh, Center uh, Advisory Council. Um, and, uh, uh, the uh, SORAC uh, uh, really uh, provides uh, making a, it's been making a positive difference in Southern Oregon for over 100 years. And it provides a trusted source of objective, science-based research and information uh, for fruit growers, farmers, ranchers, gardeners, foresters, and vendors. As that, the best evidence I can give you uh, about the value of, of SORAC to the community is the fact that last year, uh, the ballot measure that created the ser a service district to support the local f option for SORAC passed by 75%, which is was pretty, pretty outstanding. Uh, Southern Oregon Research and Extension makes a valuable contribution to Oregon's economy. It can be even bigger if the statewide public service programs are fully funded. I'm asking you to support Senate Bill 657, which would add $16 million to the OSU budget to expand the statewide service programs. Oregon is rich in natural resources. However, we've often surrendered the added value manufacturing processes to other states and countries. We need the living wage jobs that these processes can provide here in Oregon. We need to develop those added value resources in Oregon. Investing in the statewide public service programs will help make that happen. The statewide public, public service programs return ten dollars for every dollar invested. That's great leverage. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. My name is Sue Crater. I am the executive director of Ashland Supportive Housing and Community Outreach in Ashland. Um, my organization provides residential homes and support services for adults with developmental disabilities. Um, the people that we support are your most vulnerable citizens. Uh, if we were not there to support them, they would be in nursing homes. The people that we provide homes for um, are not able to live on their own in the community. We maintain support staff 24-7. Um, our support staff are the true heroes in this. Um, SOU is in Ashland. We, we employ a lot of SOU college students and um, for $10.50 an hour, I know we don't go a long way towards helping with your student loan debt, um, but we do what we can and we support you when we can. Um, what we expect you to do for $10.50 an hour is to be an expert on things like autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. We expect you to dispense medications. We expect you to understand those medications and their interactions and what happens if you get the wrong medication or if you miss a medication. In fact, we expect you to never give the wrong medication or miss a medication. We expect you to document all of those medications. We expect you to document behaviors. We expect you to understand and implement behavior support plans. Um, we expect you to work together as a team and we expect you to do all this while caring and while caring greatly. And I am really hoping that we're not going to experience any cuts in funding. Um, our system is severely stressed. There are more and more people coming into the system um, as the rate of autism has increased dramatically. And what I see is that people are leaving the system due to the stressors. And um, I just want to thank you for, for letting me have my say.
Well, welcome home to those of you from Southern Oregon, and we have another lovely sunny day for you. Uh, I'm Alan Berlin. I'm the Executive Director of the Southern Oregon Child and Family Council. We provide the Head Start and Early Head Start programs here in Josephine and in Jackson County. Uh, I've been with this agency for 43 years. I'm here to talk about two things. One is the support that you've given us in the past, and I hope we will continue for the Oregon Head Start Pre-Kindergarten program, and the other is House Bill 3380. Very briefly, I want to talk to you about what we do. We get we help children and their parents be ready for success in school and in life. We have partnerships in our local area with the Grants Pass School District, the Phoenix Town School District, the Eagle Point School District, the Central Point School District, the Medford School District, and Road Community College. We share facilities and we interchange training and other kinds of events with these districts. The reason these districts do this with us is because it works. Children enter school ready to learn. I want to let you know that currently statewide we're serving 62% of the eligible families for Head Start. In this, in locally that we have 300 names on our waiting list where parents have called and filled that application. Statewide, 2,600 families ready for Head Start that we have no room for. The reason they're waiting in line is because it works. Uh, I, want, I, want to, I want to also let you know that children are four only once in life, and we can't miss this opportunity. House Bill 3380 will provide $30 million for a mixed delivery preschool system, a third of which will go to these low-income families. Who, and in Head Start, the average family income is $10,217, which is only 43% of the federal poverty guideline. We're talking about the lowest of low-income folks in our state. Very briefly, I want to conclude with a quote. Oops, can I? Investing in early childhood development in the early formation of skills that produce valuable and productive individuals is one of the smartest ways to create a better economy and a stronger society. James Heckman, Nobel Prize winner of e in economics from the University of Chicago. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies for those of you who we couldn't get to uh, your testimony. Give you a written testimony, please let us know. Would you uh, join me, please, and just help uh, thank our staff who's traveled many, many miles. <laughs> Some of whom have been at every hearing uh, around the state. Would you please give a round of applause?